A lot of Democrats want voters to push Donald Trump out of the White House, but which candidates worry Republicans the most? I think, think all of the energy, all the passion, all the anger in the Democratic Party is on the extreme left. We sit down with Senator Ted Cruz and find out who he thinks is going to be on the 2020 ballot. Texas lawmakers push closer to their promise of major tax reform. As they said in Smokey and the Bandit, we have a long way to go and a short time to get there, but we're working hard, and today was a great first step. What the tax reform plan means for you and why some Texas leaders say they're worried about the impact. Hello, and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm John Dapkovich. The Texas Senate passed a bill this week aimed at reining in property taxes. It's a sign of progress on an issue that has been languishing in both chambers. Senate Bill 2 would require local governments to get voter approval to increase tax revenue by more than 3.5%. For school districts, it's only 2.5%. Right now, to give you an idea, that cap is at 8%. Local governments say the stricter cap would jeopardize public safety, but Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick says the caps will give Texans the tax relief they need. Senator Paul Betancourt authored SB2, and he had a message for Democrats before the vote. We've been working this problem an awfully long time. So I give a clarion call to my members of the other party. Join us, join us. Help the taxpayers. They can't afford 55% more in the next five years on their tax bills. Join us because this is real property tax relief. Well, as impassioned as the plea was, it didn't help. The bill passed, but without Democrat support. We want to take a deeper dive now into the property taxes and the budget. Joining us, Emma Platoff, the breaking news reporter for the Texas Tribune, and Jeremy Wallace, the Austin Bureau reporter for the Houston Chronicle. Welcome. Thank you. So I want to start with this, this property tax issue. And it seems like, you know, we've got Republicans that are in control of all the major positions. They've stated this is a priority. Are you surprised, and I'll start with you, Emma, that this has been such a battle? for them to get this bill through. Well, the biggest hurdle, at least on the Senate side, has been one man, Cal Seliger, an Amarillo Republican. The Senate needs 19 votes to get a bill to the floor. He was that 19th Republican vote, and he just wouldn't budge until this week. So clearing that hurdle, I think, is really good news for uh, leadership in the Senate. Do we think, though, that they're close, that, that, that there's going to be some kind of deal, something substantial and not just a kind of symbolic victory? Yeah, it, it's hard to make that promise at this mm -hmm. point. You know, like, you know, Texans have heard this story for 30 years, that your property taxes, we're going to address this, we're going to get these rates lower, and every now and then we'll have like a little bit of a glimmer, and then the next year they go back up. And so the complication of our tax system makes the promise of getting to the finish line on this very difficult. And while the Senate did make some progress this week in passing their bill, it is very different with what you know the House is talking about, what they're proposing. So, look, this is really you know early in the process still, despite being late in the process. They only have five weeks to get this solved, and I think they're going to struggle to the very last day to get this out. You mentioned uh, earlier, or we talked about earlier before we came on here, this idea of increasing the sales tax, a tax swap, if you will. If they did that, California, or state, Texas's state, state sales tax would be the highest in the country, tied with California. To me, that seems unimaginable that a Republican governor would be making a move like that. Is there any chance that they do this kind of sales tax swap, just for the politics, if nothing else, of it? It's a, it's a difficult pitch to sell, I think. This proposal is it's pitched as a constitutional amendment meaning you need a two-thirds majority in both chambers. And Democrats in both the Texas House and the Texas Senate have more than a third. So if you can't get any Democrats on board, you can't get this through either chamber. Democrats have already said they oppose this. They call it a regressive tax, which means that it basically shifts the tax and taxation burden from homeowners who may have more money to just average Texans, low-income folks who are paying sales tax. And that's something that's going to be hard to get Democrats on board with. Now, everything you might do, every change you might make, every tweak you might propose to get Democrats on board, you're going to lose people on the right, making it just all the more difficult to get to that high bar of the two-thirds majority. It, it feels to me that uh, everybody's equally 
searching around, potentially in the dark, for the solution of you know lowering taxes mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form. I think the criticism that these uh, the two percent caps on or three and a half percent caps on cities doesn't go far enough has helped produce this discussion of a ta of a sales tax swap. Mm -hmm. You know, well maybe this idea will work. You know, ha you know, you know, well maybe uh, you know raising the homestead exemption will help. You know, so I think they're just throwing everything out there trying to find some solution. I'm not sure if anybody's you know getting ahead on this, but I think they're all throwing out some kind of idea to kind of try some way to fix this you know crazy problem that we have of trying to reduce that you know burdening you know ta tax bill that everybody's getting. Prediction time. Do they get this done without having to declare a special session? Start with you, Remy. Well, if we look at the big three, so the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the House Speaker, Dennis Bonin, two of the three, the governor and the House Speaker, have said, I think we can get this done um, in you know the regular session. I think we don't need to go into overtime. Lieutenant governor has kind of left the door open. Maybe we may need to take up some, in, uh, some of our summer vacation here. So I guess I'll leave it at that. Let <laughs> them <laughs> speak yeah. for me. How about you? Yeah, it's hard to see them getting to the finish line in the regular session, uh, at least on the more aggressive stuff they want to get yeah. done. I think they could get something out in the regular session, but is it going to be enough to appease you know, the lieutenant governor and the governor and the House Speaker? I'm not so sure. I think they may, you know, there have been so many jokes that aren't so funny about going into a special session. <laughs> uh, and so I kind of think that, look, we've been doing it every two years. You know, we've been going to special sessions. I don't see how we're not going to go into another one. Cal Seliger was quoted in one of your stories as saying, I have tickets to the U.S. Open. I plan on attending that. My question <laughs> is, does he mean golf or tennis? Because one is in June, the other is in <laughs> August. There you go. That's a big question. Emma Platoff, Jeremy Wallace, thank you so much. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. A Texas mayor says the property tax plan will hurt people living in his city. Cut tens of millions out of the city budget and offers people in our community pennies. The concern city leaders have as lawmakers move toward a tighter tax cap and a different approach to school choice. Senator Ted Cruz talks about a plan that could help parents get money to pay for private schools. When Beto O'Rourke brought his presidential campaign to downtown Austin last month, Mayor Steve Adler gave him an enthusiastic speech at his rally. But last week, there was Adler on stage in South Bend, Indiana, with Pete Buttigieg, the Democrat wonderkin who has been turning up the pressure on the bigger names in the Democratic primary for 2020. Phil Prazen sat down with the mayor and asked him his reason for the change. You uh, passed up not one, but two Texans in the race and decided to endorse uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg for president. Uh, tell me about that decision. When I got elected um, uh, five years ago, I was advised uh, to reach out to the, the best mayors in the country and mm -hmm. find the, the, the one or couple that I wanted to, to most emulate and thought I could learn from. And having gone through that search, it turned out to be this 32-year-old uh, 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 mayor in, in, no, in, in South Bend. Uh, Beto and Julian, I think, are, are great. Uh, they're they're uh, wonderful people, and I, and I am friends with both of them and like them a lot. Uh, but my relationship with Pete is, is a little bit closer. A couple of weeks ago, I was at the Beto O'Rourke rally here in Austin, and you introduced Beto O'Rourke. I, in my mind, I was saying, Mayor Adler is going to be in, in Team Beto. Talk to me about how the process went for Mayor Pete to get you into his camp. Well, it was my intent uh, to, to be, as mayor, uh, someone who welcomed all the candidates to town. And, and I certainly did that for, for Beto and was happy to do that because I, I also like him a lot. But I think that's the kind of thing that, that a mayor is supposed to do uh, when, when candidates come to town calling. Uh, but then I got uh, a call from, from Pete mm -hmm. uh, who asked me to participate in his launch and, and in fact, to, to be the person who would introduce him. Let's switch topics to uh, Senate Bill 2 in the legislature now. Uh, it passed the Senate and they raised the two 0.5 percent to 3.5 percent of, of the cap. Uh, does that make it any better for you? No, it does not. Uh, you know, this Senate Bill 2 and House Bill 2 uh, cut tens of millions out of the city budget and offers people in our community pennies of, of any measure mm -hmm. of, of, of tax relief. Our 
fixed expenses, uh, health insurance, wages, the rent we pay on buildings, the things that exist in our existing budget, if we didn't do anything but just adopt last year's budget this year with those things in it, we, we, we find that we have to, to spend about 3.8% more just to keep up with inflation. The, the big three leaders up there, Bonin, Patrick, Abbott, they're looking at the property tax reform and the school finance as working together. Nine billion more dollars in school finance. Is that a package that, you know, while you don't like the property tax stuff, you'd be willing to accept because of the money in school finance? I reject the suggestion that those two things have to be linked. You know, the, the, the fact is, is that the state has been, through its school finance laws, have been pushing higher and higher and higher the school property taxes we pay. I told you again, almost a 400% increase over the last five years. Uh, and that's what people are feeling. So is, is it a win in the legislature if they kind of, if we get to the end of May and they just leave you alone? And the things that we really need the legislature to do to ensure that our property taxes go down and our schools are good. Uh, we need them to find funding to be able to do roads, uh, to fund I-35 so that we can do the kinds of projects on I-35 that we just did on Mopac North. That's the work we need our legislature to do. Mm -hmm. We don't need the legislature micromanaging the residents of the city of Austin on the social and cultural choices that they make. But Mayor Adler also said he believes state lawmakers are unfairly targeting Austin as well as several other cities run by Democrats. Some legislation being considered at the Capitol would cut back the power of local governments. Tax breaks to help parents pay for private schools? It's an idea that faces a lot of opposition but a new twist could turn the tide. There are a lot of folks, traditional blue collar unions that have a long time been Democratic allies who, who are starting to get really excited about this. A different approach Senator Ted Cruz is taking to win support for his school choice plan. Senator Ted Cruz stopped in Austin to pitch his new education reform plan to businesses it would give companies and individuals a tax credit for donating to scholarship funds. Parents could then use the money to send their kids to whatever elementary or secondary school that they want. Senator Cruz talked with our Phil Praisen about the plan and his thoughts on the 2020 presidential election. Your plan is optional for the states. Right. Uh, I've, I've been here for a couple years now covering the legislature. Similar ideas have, tr have been tried and failed. Uh, what makes you think that, that Texas would want to do this? So one of the, the roadblock school choice programs have run into here in the Texas legislature is the argument that, that, that people don't want to take money out of the public school system. Mm -hmm. This legislation doesn't take a penny out of the public school system. It's adding a total of $100 billion of new money to education, $50 billion to K through 12, $50 billion to workforce development for adults, and I think that new money at the state level and the, and the ability to expand choices and competition, what we're seeing is, is a really broad coalition starting to come together. Do you think it could pass the legislature if it didn't have the workforce component to it, if it was just K through 12? I, I don't think it would pass Congress with just K through 12, and, and, and that's the reason I added the workforce component, because what we've seen in Congress on school choice issues is a pretty sharp partisan divide. Yeah. We've got a lot of uh, consensus among Republicans Right now, congressional Democrats have opposed school choice pr uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. Part of what I'm trying to do with le this legislation is break through that, is build a broader coalition. And in particular, because of the workforce component, uh, there are a lot of folks, traditional blue-collar unions, that have a long time been Democratic allies mm -hmm. who, who are starting to get really excited about this. Are there any income requirements to this? Because I, I could see the fear being that this is going to be uh, you know, to save rich families mm -hmm. money to send their rich kids to expensive schools. So the federal legislation doesn't impose them, it leaves it to the states. Okay. But, but if you look, a lot of different states have created tax credit programs much like this. Mm -hmm. and, and most of them have imposed income requirements. You typically have something like, say, they're eligible for families that are, say, 200 percent of poverty. That's, that, that's one line that a number of them use. Okay. That would be up to the state of Texas. I, th I think there would certainly be a significant likelihood that Texas would decide to means test it. But the federal legislation doesn't mandate it because each state might answer that question a little bit differently. 
uh, under the Texas school finance system, most of the money follows the kid to the schools. So I think another thing uh, that people will be worried about is if anything that encourages kids to go out of the public school would lessen, would make the pot of money smaller. How are you going to get over that? And, and, and what do you say to people who have that fear? Well, this legislation allows states, if they so desire, to let kids choose to send that money, their scholarship, directly to the public school they're in. I mean, so that one potential could be more money for the public schools. That's up to each state how they structure it. This legislation gives states that flexibility. My objective here is to help make the public schools better. We know the overwhelming majority of the kids are educated, will continue to be educated in public schools. and, and the entire point of competition and empowering parents is to bring that competition into the system to improve the outcomes, to improve performance in the public schools. You're a small government guy. Yeah. Do we need a law for this? Because if businesses or wealthy individuals or anybody wants to donate to a scholarship to do this already, they could. Mm -hmm. Why do we need a law to do uh, this? Look, unquestionably we do, and, and, and we do for a couple of reasons. One education has long been a traditional focus of government and, and, and an important focus of government. It, it is a responsibility. We know that educating our kids determines the future of Texas. If we do it, we've got a bright future. And if our kids don't get an education, our, our future is badly troubled. Number two, this is designed to be, be federal tax credits. That, that has been a, a long vehicle of incentivizing conduct that, that is beneficial. It was critically important to me in this bill to respect federalism. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to see a national school board dictating what's taught in the schools. And so this bill prohibits the feds from having any involvement whatsoever in curriculum, staying completely out of it. It is simply a tax credit for contributions to scholarship granting organizations. And that leaves curriculum decisions, that leaves design of the program at the state and local level where it's directly accountable to Texans. Is there a candidate you think Republicans should fear out of the Democrats? And do you think, is there a candidate that you hope they nominate that would be easy to beat? Uh, you know, I don't know that there's anyone easy to beat. Um, uh, let me take it one piece at a time. Let's, let's start in the primary. Um, I think they're going to nominate someone from the extreme left. Uh, and, and the reason is, I think, think all of the energy, all the passion, all the anger in the Democratic Party is on the extreme left. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in my view, the most likely nominees are, are one of four people, Kamala Harris, Beto O'Rourke, Bernie Sanders, or Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and that's just where I see the passion. Now, your old opponent. <laughs> I, in, in, indeed, it, it is uh, interesting watching. But look, the, the, there are some Republicans who are thrilled to go, okay, great, if they nominate someone from the far left, that means we win. Look, I, I don't think that's necessarily true. We are an evenly divided country. Um, 180,000 votes switch in 2016 and Hillary Clinton is the president. We're having a fundamental debate in the United States right now about what kind of country are we? Are we going to be a socialist country, which a number of these candidates are openly calling for, or are we gonna continue to embrace American free enterprise, which, which the American free enterprise system has been the greatest enemy poverty has ever seen. If you care about social justice, socialism doesn't work. Free enterprise has lifted millions of people, billions of people worldwide out of poverty. And, and so this fundamental debate is a debate I'm engaged in and going to continue engaged in, but it's a debate that matters to Texans, matters to people across the country. Cruz's plan next has to pass the Senate Finance Committee. Eventually, though, it would have to make it through the House, where Democrats are in control. But so far, none have signed on to support it. A teenage girl raped and forgotten, her case untouched for decades. I live with that fear, uh, the hidden fear, not knowing if he was really somewhere watching, lurking. How her story could lead to a law that would help others like her find justice. After weeks of behind-the-scenes policy scuffles between Texas' largest law enforcement union and high-ranking state lawmaker, a House panel voted in favor of a bill to increase police transparency when suspects die in custody. It comes after our ongoing investigation revealed law enforcement agencies across the state using a loophole in the state's Public Information Act to keep records secret. Under the bill, information must be released if a suspect is deceased, or incapacitated, and that does not, though, include internal affairs records related to dead suspects 
even in cases where the misconduct is only alleged, not proven. The executive director of the Combined Law Enforcement Associations of Texas, or CLEAT for short, tells us that his group is, quote, done talking with the bill's author, Representative Joe Moody, and also feels, quote, completely misled about his intent, even calling the measure a, quote, war against the police. Moody tells us that Cleet's response was disappointing, and he said, quote, frankly dishonest. He said the bill has always been presented as an open records measure and that he's always been a very strong ally of law enforcement. We'll keep you updated on the bill's progress in the final weeks of the session at the Capitol. State lawmakers have unanimously approved a bill to help reduce the backlog of untested rape kits in Texas. House Bill 8 requires an audit of untested rape kits and sets deadlines for those kits to be analyzed. The bill also extends the statute of limitations for certain sex crimes. We can send a message to the women of Texas that your voices are being heard. We believe you and that the Texas House of Representatives is legislating justice. The bill is named after Lavinia Masters, a woman who was raped when she was just 13 years old. Her rape kit, though, sat untested for more than 20 years. By then, the statute of limitations had run out on the case. Masters tweeted that the vote had her in tears. The bill now goes to the Senate. Thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm John Dabkovich. We'll be back next week to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.